All right. Uh, so my name is Chris Reed. I'm an indie game lawyer. Uh, I don't bite, though. Uh, and this is Practical Law 101 for Indie Devs. Not scary edition. So my love of games started when I was about five years old, uh, watching my brother play Ultima 3 and Zork on our family's Apple IIe. And then, like an older brother, he turned around and threatened me at fist point to sign this contract, which my parents preserved, which says that I will pay him all my current cash supply if I broke one of the five and a quarter inch floppies with the games on them. Not a very good game contract. Uh, so <laughs> it's not a surprise that a couple decades later I ended up uh, with my own law practice where I work with indie game developers and people in the game space to help them with basically all their legal issues. Uh, I'm proud to announce that we've just hired our first paralegal. Uh, I just spoke with him on the phone. He's having a little bit of trouble with the billing software, but hopefully he'll get it. Uh, with the help of my co-counsel, Mr. Phoenix Wright, I want to make a quick disclaimer, which is that I am not your lawyer unless I am. Uh, and this presentation is legal education, not legal advice, but I do hope you learn something. Uh, my goal today is to help all of you identify and avoid common legal pitfalls. Uh, so, we've got not a lot of time, and the time that it would take to go over everything that I think is important is about this long. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, we have about enough time for a game of Hearthstone. Maybe two. I think that's Mage Aggro. I haven't played in a while. So we're going to cover five topics. Uh, creating a company, contracts, intellectual property, infringement, and privacy. For each topic, I'm going to tell you why you should care, when you should care, and what you need to know about it. So, first topic uh, is creating a company. And by a company, I mean the legal corporate entity. Why should you care about this? Well, a company is sort of like the legal equivalent of a suit of power armor. It protects you and gives you cool abilities. Some of these include limited liability. Uh, this means that if there are debts or liabilities that you incur in business, they only stick to the company. That's all that's at risk, not your personal assets, which can be very important. It also acts as a convenient bucket for intellectual property, meaning that you can assign all the rights in the game from the individuals who create the pieces of the game to the company. It's all in one place. The company can then license it. It's a convenient way to share ownership and profits in the company. Uh, it's the way that you figure out who owns what and how voting is handled. There are tax reasons. We won't get into them because I don't do tax, but you should talk to your accountant. Uh, finally, on a sort of practical note, uh, having a corporate entity enables you to be taken more seriously in business dealings. Most people expect to be dealing with an actual company and not with a group of people who are individuals calling themselves a studio. So when do you need to be thinking about this? Ideally, before you start working at all. Uh, but let's be realistic, that's probably not what's going to happen. So realistically, you should put this together around about the time that you start to get serious, meaning putting in a significant amount of time or money into the project in your game. And the latest at which you should do this and put together a company is probably before you enter into agreements with other people, either co-founders or you start hiring people. So what should we know about putting together a company? Uh, there's a couple of things you want to discuss with your co-founders or with yourself if you're uh, doing it solo. First off, whether there's going to be any future investment. Now, this may not be the case for a lot of indies, but some people do eventually end up seeking some outside money, and that can, knowing about that in the future lets you uh, make certain decisions in how you structure things. Um, you need to know who owns and controls the company. So what are the percentages of ownership of people who are actual founders? And not everyone working on it has to be an equity owner. Um, we'll get to that. And how is voting handled? How do you make decisions in your company? These are things you want to discuss and be clear on before you proceed. Uh, there's a technical thing you're going to have to choose, which is the type of entity. It's mostly a tax issue. There are a few differences. Just be aware you'll have to make this choice before you go and file to create the entity. Uh, and this is the step where you fill out some paperwork, it gets sent to the state usually, and there's a fee, and this is when the company becomes a real legal entity. That means you can go start your bank account, you can sign contracts on behalf of the company. It's now, it comes into existence. But that's not the end. The last thing you want to do is draft an operating agreement or a shareholders agreement. This is the document where all those things you discussed either in your own head or with your co-founders get put down in writing and agreed to formally. Uh, this is important to have in place, even if you're a solo or the single member LLC. 
So, companies, form one, form one early. Our next issue is contracts, and I guarantee you that as indie developers, you are going to encounter at least one contract. So, why should you care about contracts? Contracts provide clarity and predictability uh, in any business relationship. It's like the rule book. People can go and look and see exactly what the rules are and how it works. The simple fact of sitting down to talk about a contract and negotiate it tends to make people think through more issues than they would have, which means that you're less likely to end up in a fight if you've really discussed this stuff. And having it signed and in place protects you against the worst case scenario and the best case. By that I mean, obviously, if things go wrong, having the contract is good, you know what the rules are. But it's also the case that sometimes things can go very right and you have sudden unexpected success and people who said, yeah, it's cool, it's free, you can use that asset, and now that there's money involved, they don't feel that way. So you want to have that contract in place before that point comes. Finally, certain things require a written contract to accomplish. For your purposes, we're talking about transferring intellectual property. All right, so when do you want to think about contracts? Repeat after me. Before you do anything with anyone. I couldn't be more clear about this. But I think I will be more clear about this. Before any of the following things, which is a big scary list, feel free to snap a photo, but it's in the vault. Uh, we're, we're going to be talking today about two specific types of contracts that I think are important. The independent contractor or work for hire agreement and publishing agreements. So what do we want to know about contracts? Well, in general, there are certain clauses that come up in most contracts, and you should be aware of them. The term and termination clause. This means how long does it last, how do you get out of it, what happens when it gets terminated, who pays whom what, how's it calculated. Speaking of who, who pays whom, it's important to know what people are getting paid, not just how much, but how on what time frame, how it's calculated. There's a lot of flexibility with Indies. I've seen all sorts of stuff, uh, hourly, hourly with a cap, a flat fee, uh, milestones, a revenue share, and a combination of these. But what's important is it be defined clearly so that both sides know how it works. And speaking of defining things clearly, you want to also define the services and deliverables. This means the things that each side has promised to do. So services they're going to provide or something they're going to create, like an art asset or a soundtrack. Uh, you want it to be very clear what it is, not just some music for the game. There's also a section in most contracts called warranties and indemnification that most people just sort of skip over because it looks weird. This is where each side makes a promise to the other about certain things that they're saying are true, and then pro and the indemnification is where you say, and if it's not true, then I'm the one on the hook. Practically, what does this mean for you? That means usually things like promising that you didn't steal the IP, it's original work, and that someone's not going to sue them if they use it. And if they do sue them, you promise to be on the hook. This is the section where you can take on a, li a lot of liability, so it's important to know what you're promising and make sure that it's true. Finally, there's a couple other terms that end up at the end of most contracts, where you end up getting sued, whether you can talk about the contract or the terms of it, and whether you might be stopped from competing or bringing along employees from someone that you work for. So let's move on to one of the two types of common contracts that I think you're very likely to encounter. And this one is called the work for hire agreement, or sometimes known as the independent contractor agreement. It is between the developer and the contractor. The contractor could be anyone who's contributing something to the game, a coder, an artist, a sound person, and it could even be a company that's providing that sort of services as a company. So what do you need to know about work for hire agreements? A couple of specific terms that are important. First off, they're called work for hire because this is the agreement where you assign the IP rights from the contractor to the company. We talked about a bucket for IP. This is how you take those rights and put them in the bucket so that the company owns all the rights. It's very important to have that in place. It creates what's called a work for hire arrangement. You also want to be very clear as the developer uh, how you're paying them. Um, and you know, as we said, a lot of flexibility here, but make sure that it's clear. Uh, they may ask for some upfront afterwards. Uh, just make sure that you know. And if it's a revenue share, just make sure it's defined properly. You also want to define, again, the scope of work. This is tied to the deliverables. You want to make it clear what's expected. You don't just say the soundtrack. You say you know, up to a minimum of six minutes of music with 
whatever, you know, technical specifications, you don't have to go into perfect detail, but it needs to be not vague. Finally, you want to know about how you can get out of the contract. For a work for hire agreement, this usually means what happens if you just not feel in the art and you want to let them go, you need someone else. Well, you need to know this is you normally wouldn't be able to get out of the contract unless your termination section has a right for the company to terminate for convenience. And if it does, well, then the other side is going to want to know, hey, well, what do I get paid? What happens when I get terminated? Is there a kill fee? Think about these things. The next type of agreement, uh, and this is a very wide range of types of agreements, but it would be a development or a publishing agreement. Uh, a lot of indies, even if they develop on their own, might consider going to a publisher for things like marketing, or it may be an old school agreement where they kicked in money up front. Um, this is between the publisher and the developer. Um, don't tease the octopus, kids. So, uh, what do you need to know about development and publishing agreements? A couple of familiar faces. IP rights. In this case, you're the developer, so you want to think, am I assigning and selling all the rights, the IP rights to my game, or am I simply licensing them to the publisher if they're distributing? And if I'm licensing... That's not just one thing. There's a difference between licensing in one country on one platform for a year and licensing worldwide on all platforms forever. Uh, so you need to read that and know what you're actually licensing. Because you're the one getting paid, it's doubly important to know how that works. Uh, in a publishing arrangement, usually there's some kind of revenue share agreement. And that means you should know how revenue is defined, what kind of things are deducted before you make that split, um, and you should know if there's any kind of recoupment where the publisher take, you know, makes back their money before you see a dime. All these things, it shouldn't be one sentence. It should be a detailed section. So if it looks short, you should be worried. It's vague. Next, I want you all to be aware of scope creep. Uh, this comes up in the context of when you as a studio are being hired to make someone for someone else, uh, which isn't always. But if it's the case, you can have a situation where you've agreed to do it for a certain budget, and they keep asking for changes and changes and changes and new features. You want the ability to say, this increases the scope of what I agreed to, you need to pay me more or we're not doing it. But you need that right in the contract or you can't say that. Another thing that comes up often with publishing agreements are what are called derivative works. These means things that are based on your game. So, for your purposes, that means prequels, sequels, DLC, but it can also mean any type of merchandising you know, candy, plush toys, whatever, uh, and also things like adaptations, comics, movies. Um, this can be quite lucrative and a big deal, depending on how the, how the story of your brand goes, and sometimes these end up in a publishing agreement where you're agreeing to just give them, oh, and 30% of all this derivative works, as if that's nothing. Make sure you decide whether or not it makes sense for your developer to, or your publisher to be involved, and who's making the decisions about these derivative works, and who's going to pay to develop them. Finally, yet again, make sure you know how to get out of a bad deal. You want a termination clause that enables you to leave if things aren't going well. Uh, a practical way to do that, either you have a limited term, so that's only for two years, and then you can decide, or if it goes longer, you might want a clause that says, look, you need to meet Mr. Publisher, Mrs. Publisher, I'd like you guys to meet a, a minimum amount of money that you're going to make me in the first year, and if you don't hit that, I get to take my ball and go home. I could do it better myself or with someone else. So, uh, contracts are everywhere. We only covered two of the main types because we don't have a lot of time, but make sure to read them, and the terms are important. Our next topic is intellectual property, which I'm sure you've heard of and we've already mentioned it a bit, so let's get into some details. There are a bunch of types of intellectual property, but for indie developers, I think by far the most relevant on a practical level are copyright and trademarks. There's a few others that can come up, but they're very unlikely and we're not going to go over them much. Patents are things like novel software algorithms, maybe if it's a physical thing. Um, they're very expensive to get. They might be narrow in terms of the protection. Uh, trade secrets are things like customer lists, pricing models, things that you keep secret for business advantage. And right of publicity is when you deal with the name and likeness of a celebrity or a public figure. So, why should you care about intellectual property? Well, it turns out that there might be a few parts of your game that involve intellectual property. Like, say, yeah, like all of it, basically. Uh, with one very important exception that we're going to discuss. So, uh, Moving on, when should you be thinking about intellectual property? 
you should be thinking about intellectual property as far as copyright goes before it is created, and this is where we need to go back to those work for hire agreements, get those in place, then let the person start working, ideally, don't do it 10 months later. And when the game is released, you should consider registering your copyright. This is not compulsory, you don't have to do this, but it's helpful and it's cheap. For trademarks, you should think about registering them and thinking about them before launch, meaning that before you choose your name and design a sweet logo, you should do a little bit of research. At least run a Google search. Make sure there isn't some other game out there called Overwatch. Oops. Yeah, uh, it's important. You can save a lot of money by running a, a, a search. So, um, you should do it as soon as practical. If you want to register, it takes money, and sometimes you don't have the budget for this. But it will come later. So, what do you need to know about copyright? Well, copyright protects fixed expression of ideas, which is lawyer speak for your creative content. So that means things like the dialogue, the UX, the animation, the art assets, the sound, the music, uh, and even the code. Uh, it's a lot of, almost all of what goes into your game. But importantly, it does not protect abstract ideas. This is the exception I talked about. Your game rules, your mechanics, the idea behind the game, are not protected on their own, which is tough because it's often the inspiration for the game. This is why we can have a million match three games and not have them infringe each other. Finally, I want to note that uh, by default, at least under US copyright law, by creating something that's copyright protectable, you own the copyright, period. You don't have to register it. There's nothing you have to file. You own it because you made it. That's the default rule. That's why it's important to have those work for hire agreements we talked about so that you override that default and it's owned by the company. What else to know about copyright? Copyright gives you the following rights. For your purposes, the important ones are the ability to reproduce and distribute and to make derivative works. And not coincidentally, these are the things that are usually at issue in a publishing agreement. So let's move on to trademarks. Uh, often confused with copyright, they are not the same thing. The purpose of trademarks is to protect brands and consumers' understanding of who made what. So they protect things like titles, company names, logos, and taglines. There are two sources of how you get trademark protection. The first in the US is called common law rights, and that comes from as soon as you start selling something using a trademark, and the selling part is important, you start to accrue rights from that date forward. It's kind of like an XP bar that fills up over time gradually. Um, it's based on how widely you've sold it, how well it's known. It might be a little more difficult to prove. So there's another source of protection, which is to go ahead and register federally. This takes an actual application process that could be rejected. It does come with certain fees. I tell people to expect around 1,500 total. Um, but it gives you some benefits if you ever end up in court. It means that your trademark unequivocally applies equally across the entire territory. And yes, there are similar processes for the EU and other territories. Um, and most importantly, it lets you call dibs in advance before you've sold your game. So that's the exception to the, ha you have to use it. Not forever in advance, but up to three years in advance if you need that much time. And as we said, in order to get your trademark rights, other than using it in advance, you must use it in commerce, meaning selling it for money. So what does this mean? Announcing your game's name on your dev blog two years before it comes out does not give you any trademark rights. When you start selling the game, that's when you start to accrue the rights. Um, and that's why it's so interesting and useful that registration lets you get ahead of that a little bit. Finally, the strength of a trademark is based on how distinctive it is. Something that literally describes uh, what you do, game company, jumpy platform, bad trademark. Something that is totally arbitrary is a good trademark. So intellectual property, pretty complicated topic. This is super oversimplified, but make sure to be aware of it. Know what you own via contracts and protect it. Our next topic is, I think, a sore one for a lot of people. Uh, it's infringement. And why should you care about it? Well, I think you all know why you should care about it. It takes away profit. It takes away revenue. Uh, it can tarnish your brand. It's just not a lot of fun. So when should you be thinking about it? Well, as far as registering your different types of IP, for copyright, again, you should register at release just to get it out of the way because it's simple. Then you don't have to think about it. Or at the very latest, before you might end up suing someone or at least threaten to sue them because having copyright registered 
multiplies the damages you can ask for. It basically just makes the hammer you're threatening them with really, really big. For trademark, you should do this as soon as practical, right? I think you should register it before the game comes out, but practically you might not have the budget, so wait until, the, you know, wait until your, your budget and your revenue justifies it. As far as responding to trademark infringement or copyright infringement, I would say do it as soon as you notice. Uh, don't, don't snooze on it. So let's talk about copyright infringement and specifically about cloning. Um, I regret to inform you that copyright infringement does not have a magic bullet solution. Uh, it's difficult to prove in the legal sense. There's this term substantial similarity, which makes it sound like it's common sense, but it's not when it comes to the legal side of it. It may be obvious common sense, but uh, a lawsuit is expensive and you may not win. But there are practical things you can do. So, someone is cloning your game or has stolen art assets or sound directly from you, First thing you could do is to send a cease and desist letter. This goes to the infringer and it says, hey, we noticed you stole our stuff. You need to stop doing it by this time or else. You can also send a request to the content host. So you could send it to Apple or to Steam to ask them to take down the offending, infringing content. This is done under the copyright context by what's called a DMCA takedown notice. It's a formalized process. There's a couple of requirements. Most things like Steam and Apple have a walkthrough for it. Now, I am aware that these have a pretty bad reputation in some quarters. Uh, I like to think of them basically as lightsabers. Uh, they could be used for good or for evil. Uh, and in this case, you're using them for good. Uh, you should register the copyright if you haven't already when you notice the infringement. And then you could sue. Uh, again, a lawsuit, tens of thousands of dollars minimum. Um, you may not win. Uh, so it does happen. Uh, people do sue in triple town. Uh, usually it ends up in a settlement. It's very expensive and cost prohibitive for most indies. So let's move on to trademark infringement, which is when people have names for games that are confusingly similar to the public. Uh, which can be a real issue, especially in mobile, where everything's you know, in the same list. And Flappy Bird, good example. Some of the solutions are kind of the same. You can send a cease and desist letter to the infringer. And I want to note that the tone of these doesn't have to be universally aggressive. Um, I think a lot of people just send out cookie cutter, really scary letters, and those are justified sometimes. But I like to look at what the situation is, who the infringer is, and I ask myself, what happens if this letter we send ends up on Reddit? Well, will it seem justified or will we seem like total dicks? So depending on who you're sending it to, you might want to take a softer tone at first. Uh, you can also contact the distribution platforms again. While it's not DMCA, technically, Apple, Steam, they all have standard policies for asking for stuff to be removed because of trademark infringement. This gets the stuff down. And finally, I want to note that unlike copyright, you do have to continue enforcing your trademark to keep it strong. Um, if you ignore 20 infringers and then you want to stop the 21st because that's the one you care about, they do have a valid argument that your trademark doesn't have as much protection because you never enforced it. It doesn't mean you have to stomp on everyone, but for instance, King.com, Banner Saga, um, it was a very ugly situation, but the part where King.com said, yeah, we kind of have to enforce our trademark, that wasn't bullshit. Um, <laughs> some of the other parts, well, I leave you to your judgment. So, uh, the takeaways are that there are no magic bullets, but there are practical things you can do, and you should do them early. Our final topic is privacy, which I think is a blind spot for some indies. Um, a lot of people may think it doesn't apply to them. So, why should you care about privacy? Well, most, if not all, games these days collect some amount of user data, uh, whether it's through you know, directly collecting it, like... Um, geolocation, or through third-party stuff. So even if you're a single-player puzzle game, you've got leaderboards, that's taking data from your users, putting it elsewhere. Uh, Twitter integration, same thing. Um, any payment processing, ad networks, all of these are privacy issues. Governments, uh, specifically the U.S. government, state and local, and the EU, have been getting a lot more aggressive about enforcing privacy issues, and they don't just target big people. People can and do get fined, uh, and they have to pay money. Um, there's obviously a reputational issue at stake. Uh, think about how the public is responding to the Apple iPhone issue. People are thinking about privacy. It matters. And finally, data breaches. They can and they do happen. Uh, Sony is still paying a lot and a lot of reputational damage for the hacks a while back. So when should you be thinking about privacy? Uh, I think you should be thinking about it at three times. 
One, during development, uh, because this is the time at which you can decide, you know, do we really need to track like the geolocation of our users, or would that just be cool? Um, it's cheaper to take that out before the game's done. You should think about it at launch, uh, because you need to have a privacy policy in place. And you should continue to think about it post-launch, because things can change. An update might add a new feature with a new privacy issue. You may start using an ad network, or the uh, terms of the people you work with might change, and you need to be aware of that. So what are the best practices for privacy? The main rule for me, if you don't need it, don't collect it. I like to call this the Jurassic Park principle. Just because you can breed velociraptors does not mean that you should breed velociraptors. I know they're totally awesome, but they can open doors. So uh, you should know and disclose the third parties that you share your data with uh, because you'll be sharing your users' data with them. That means ad networks. That means leaderboards. That means... Uh, you know, anything that is a third party taking data. You need to know what they do with it, and you need to disclose it in a prominent and accessible privacy policy. Uh, this means accessible from, you know, the bottom of your website everywhere, and on the splash screen of your game, or at the very least in the main menu. Um, and please, please, if you remember one thing about privacy, do not do this. I know it's tempting. Do not copy-paste someone else's privacy policy, change the company name, and say, cool, we're done. Uh, because now, congratulations, you are probably actively lying to your users because you have no idea what's in there and you probably don't do what it says. Uh, that's a great way to get fined. So what goes into one of these privacy policies? The following things. Um, it should be simple. It should be four-ish pages. It should be readable by a real human, not a lawyer. Um, and it tells them what you're collecting, how you use it, uh, who you share it with, and how they can get access to it and change it if there's a problem, and what you're doing to protect it. Um, and you want to be honest. This is not the place to hide things. You need to disclose everything, even if you might not do it. If you may do it, say you may do it. Finally, if your game is marketed to people under 13, there is a host of additional things that apply because of a law called COPPA. Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. We don't have time to get into it. It is a huge morass. Um, my advice would be to talk to a privacy professional, avoid collecting personally identifiable information, like names, pictures, and potentially to talk to uh, a company that's called a COPPA Safe Harbor. These are companies that are certified to be able to help you become compliant. You pay them, they help you. So privacy, please take it seriously. Have a privacy policy, keep it up to date. So uh, we've made it through quite, quite a large amount of uh, potentially dry stuff. I'm, I'm happy that you came along with me. Um, and with that, we've reached the end. Uh, congratulations. Uh, thank you very much for attending. And, and I would be happy to take some questions now and then afterwards in the, uh, the spillover room and probably at the bar if you find me later, too. So um, great. Uh, happy to take questions. I think there's a mic in the middle, too. You can go there. I'm just going to say it's an awesome presentation. Thank you very much. I enjoyed oh, it. Th thank you very much. <laughs> hey, um, I'm a solo indie, and I was given some advice uh, a while ago about starting um, a single-person LLC, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically I was told that um, there's not... From the, uh, if you're being sued and you are a sole proprietor or a single person LLC, you are not any more protected than if you uh, hadn't formed that corporation or whatever at all. Is that true or is that bullshit? Uh, I mean, I, again, the, the answer to a lot of these will be it depends, because, uh, which is why this is education, not, not advice. It, it does depend on the situation. Um, uh, you will have some level of liability protection, but it depends on how you run things. I mean, the reason that you want to have like a um, have the sort of uh, the documents in place as far as the operating agreement, even if you're a solo, is that if you make an LLC, but then you just kind of act like a person and you don't do anything, you know, no formalities, you don't keep any records. Uh, from a legal perspective, it allows them to argue in a dispute, hey, this isn't really a company. They're just pretending they're a company, right? It's the same thing as if you have a corporation and you never have meetings and you never take minutes and that kind of stuff. Those formalities matter. Um, one of the reasons, uh, definitely as a sole proprietor, yeah, they, 
you don't have any. Um, that, that's not a you know an actual corporate entity. Um, but as an LLC, one of the other reasons you want to do it beyond just the uh, liability protection is even if it's just you, you may work with other people. And if you work with them and you don't really have contracts, but someone's been working with you for a while, you've got an LLC. Later on, they say, hey, I thought, I remember a conversation where you were going to give me equity. And you say, no, 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 that's, no, no, you're a contractor. Uh, that was our agreement. And he goes, well, I, you know, I think I contributed X amount to the company. If you don't have the document that says, here are the rules, I'm the sole owner, I'm the manager, I have 100% of the equity, that can be more of a nasty fight. So, yeah. Thanks. Hi. Uh, thanks. That was a really great talk. Oh, thank um, you. I'm, this might be a very short question. Have you ever heard of an online tool that's called Do Contract that yes. some indie game developers put together? Okay. Yes. I, uh, I think I talked to the, to the person putting that together uh, when, they were, when they were doing it. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. So, cool. are you? Is there a question? Oh no, question? no. The, the the question was if you're familiar with it because I've used it. I used it with the composer yeah. on my game. I'm just curious. Yeah. How good you feel it is as a contract, and if you think that it's worth using, or if so, I haven't looked in detail at it, uh, so I can't I can't render an opinion on it without looking at it. Um, I would say that um, you know I definitely understand the budget constraints of an indie and and the you know the desire to do to use tools like that. Um, usually, you're better off with a contract, but here's the big caveat. Um, don't use a tool that you don't understand. Uh, so, you know, if you having a contract is important, but also knowing what it does. Because if you say, yeah, yeah, just give me the contract that does X, as, uh, and there may be single sentences in there that do the opposite of what you think they do. Um, and so, you know, for, from my perspective in my practice, I, I try not to just like fire off a form contract and be like, here, use this. Um, I like to walk a client through it and say, look, here's what it's doing. Is this what you agreed to? Like, does this actually conform to your agreement? I want them to be comfortable. And it goes back to that whole, if you've negotiated, thought about it, you're not going to be surprised. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I believe the person who put it together uh, had mentioned they'd talked to a lot of attorneys. So, uh, but I, you know, I can't give you an official opinion on it. I just would say, make sure you understand what you use if you get it from, from a non-lawyer source. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, great talk. Thanks. Um, just as regards COPPA, could you, without getting into it, I know you said it's sure. big, uh, could you possibly clarify on the definition of marketing towards under 30 years? Sure, like, sure. So, would a universal uh, audience include that or not? Sure. Uh, so the question was about COPPA and uh, children under 13 and the privacy laws there. It's a U.S. law. Um, the very broad strokes are that it applies to uh, not just basically any Internet operator, someone who does stuff on the Internet or collects data, um, and the, you are included under it if your product or game uh, is targeted at or arguably appeals to, in a major way, uh, people under 13. So, yeah, any game that's fairly simple might fall under COPPA. Uh, the, it's concerned with the collection of personally identifiable information. So if there's just like, if you're randomly collecting, you know, a, a, a randomized uh, unique ID for the phone or whatever, that's not as much of an issue as if you're taking a name or a birthday. Um, so that's kind of how it's defined who's, who's under it. And you're allowed to collect that stuff, but you're required to get what's called verifiable parental consent, which is this nightmare that's really, really difficult because the law was designed for websites in like 99, not for mobile apps. Um, so again, a, a one easy way is you may just decide to age gate. You put up a, a thing that what's your birthday and neutral age gate. You don't say, are you under 13? You say, what's your birthday? And you shunt anyone, uh, who falls under 13 somewhere else. Um, or you put them into a version of the app that doesn't have ads or anything that's going to be collecting, uh, data. That's about as deep as I can go. Trust me, it's a, a very deep well. So I would talk to a privacy person or, uh, one of the safe harbor companies. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, hello, I had a question about uh, parody. Like, in, if you say you're making a comedic game, I don't know, like the, the South Park sure. games, for example, how sure. does that apply for? Sure. Like, why do you? How do you say? Oh, this is a parody work, and right. what's a violation? So, so the question was about parody. Um, you know, making fun of things, which is a copyright question. Uh, and I know <laughs> uh, fair use is a very popular topic on the internet. Uh, I deliberately didn't address it because I wanted to stick to stuff I felt was uh, most common in my practice. And the number of times it comes up realistically is is, is quite limited. But in general. Um, copyright infringement happens when you use something that's protected without permission. Um, fair use, of which parody is an example, 
not a technical category, but an example, um, fair use is an exception to that. So I know this gets technical, but uh, some, someone has described once fair use as the right to be sued by Disney. And what they mean by that, I mean, yeah, it's funny, but it's also accurate because what they mean by that is fair use, you know, if, if, if your defense is, hey, we made this game with Mickey Mouse. Oh, no, but we're making fun of him. He's, he's drinking booze. It's clearly not, uh, which was a, actually a case from the 70s. Um, Basically, uh, the only time you get to make that argument is in court. It's an affirmative defense. That means you can't just be like, no, you can't take us to court because fair use. Like, no, no, we're suing you. If you want to make it your case to the judge why this is fair use, you're going to do it in court. And by that point, you've already spent a ton of money just to have that conversation. Um, what I would say is, in general, if it's close to the line, you're taking on more risk. It's a question of risk, right? Um, so it's not, there are no uh, bright lines here. Under US copyright law, fair use is determined on these like factors, which means, cool, a lot of things could be fair use, but it also means to figure out if it really is, you have to go to court. And that's a game for people with a lot of money, unfortunately. All right, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hi, thanks for doing this talk. Oh, no problem. Um, how much screen shake can I legally get away with? <laughs> <laughs> the question was how much screen shake can you legally get away with? Uh, you know, um, as much as you like. Um, I, one of the con but I think the, the way this ties into the talk is I mentioned uh, that there were a lot of other types of contracts that come up. Um, one of them is the EULA, the End User License Agreement. Um, that is one that everyone makes fun of, doesn't read, like, you know, it's boring. It is important. Um, and that is the section where if your game contains stuff that might be like an epilepsy risk or, you know, some, you know, may have some medical thing, that's where you make the giant all caps disclaimer that says, look, if this blows up your computer and melts half your face, sorry, as is, bear, you know, buyer beware. Um, so that is important. Um, and, you know, anything that might come up through the use of your stuff is handled in the end user license agreement. And those also are not cookie cutter because they should apply to what kind of game you have. Uh, just as a note, since I mentioned them, EULAs are a great place to handle if you've got user-generated content. That's where you talk about, hey, do you own the stuff you make in my game? Do I own it? Uh, if you upload like photos or something or, or anything to my game, do we get a license to use it? Uh, you know, you want to take care of all that in there. So that's, yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Oh, uh, wait, uh, last question. I'm the last question, everybody. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, uh, as a composer, um, with smaller projects or smaller teams, we usually keep the copyrights in the IP. But I know with larger AAA companies and games, that becomes a work for hire normally. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, at what point do you see that changeover when it comes to like budget or company size or sure. what? Um, so the question was about uh, composers and, and how sometimes the, the IP to the compositions is licensed rather than assigned as a work for hire like we discussed. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, com musicians tend to be actually the place where I see the most uh, people requesting that it be uh, a license rather than work for hire. And I think that has to do with just the history of the music industry and, and musicians being a little more aware of IP issues than, yeah. than other creative industries traditionally. Um, I would say that it's not necessarily a function of size. Um, it really ba It's based on the situation, right? Mm -hmm. So from... But neither side is trying to screw the other. Uh, what's going on is uh, the... The developer wants to have it as work for hire because that's so much simpler. If they yeah. ever need to remix the sound, if they're going to put it in a trailer somewhere, if they use a snippet of it in the sequel but not the whole thing, they just want to know that they don't have to hunt down the person and make sure that it was within the license. Because when you license it, you've got to be like, what are the exact parameters where you can use it, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's really something to be negotiated, right? A lot of times I've seen uh, musicians say, look, um, it's this much per uh, minute of song if it's a license, and I get to sell. And then in that case, you want to determine who can sell the soundtrack. If they sell the soundtrack, can they use the name of the game and you know, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, or if you want it you know, lock, stock, and barrel, then that's fine, but it's going to be more expensive, right? Yeah. Uh, it, so it's not like one or the other. It's more what the parties uh, need and what they can afford, I would say. Yeah, it seems like the one area where it's not necessarily always switched over to the company to own. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I think that at the lower level, you probably don't earn so much, and you can actually get a lot of revenue through soundtrack sales. And if you eliminated that, then... So I think that's... Yeah, it's just a weird corner area. All right, I don't know what I'm saying. Thank you. No, no, that was, that was very helpful to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Thanks. Thanks for coming. I'll be in the. Uh, yeah. And. Uh,